Lieutenant General Daniel Hokanson, Director, Army National Guard. Lieutenant General Charles Lucky, Chief, Army Reserve, Commanding General, United States Army Reserve Command. Gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce your head table for the 2019 Dwight D. Eisenhower Luncheon. Command Sergeant Major Ted Copeland, Command Sergeant Major United States Army Reserve. Command Sergeant Major John Sampa. Command Sergeant Major United States Army National Guard. Tom, I don't know where Jason... Chaplain Brigadier General William Green, Jr. Deputy Chief of Chaplains, United States Army. Major General Omar Jones. Commanding General, United States Army, Military District of Washington. Uh, sorry, I got distracted. Lieutenant General Daniel Hokanson, Director, Army National Guard. Lieutenant General Charles Lucky. Chief, Army Reserve, Commanding General, United States Army Reserve Command. Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston. General John Murray. Commanding General, Army Futures Command. General Gustav Perna, Commanding General, United States Army Materiel Command. Major General Pete Johnson, Acting Commanding General, United States Army Pacific. General Michael Garrett, United States Army Forces Command. General Paul Funk, Commanding General, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command. The Honorable Ryan McCarthy, Secretary of the Army. General Carter Ham, United States Army Retired, President and Chief Executive Officer, Association of the United States Army. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our honored guest and keynote speaker, Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General James McConville. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Eisenhower Luncheon honored guests. Okay, good afternoon. Don't sit down. Right? We'll take a, just a minute, but welcome to, to the Dwight David Eisenhower Luncheon for 2019. And again, the theme for this year, America's Army, ready now, investing in the future. Uh, please remain standing 
as we welcome uh, the Army Deputy Chief of Chaplain, Chaplain Brigadier General Green, to invoke our blessing. And please remain standing for the national anthem. Chaplain Green. Please bow with me. Almighty God, thank you for your enduring presence in this place today. As we celebrate and reflect upon a great statesman, an outstanding military leader, and an, ex and an, and an outstanding person, we are especially thankful for the unwavering commitment to our great nation demonstrated by these outstanding non-commissioned officers who will be recognized for their excellence in service today. We humbly ask that you continue to lead and guide us as we strive to be better and to do our part to support and defend our ideals, values, and way of life. O oh Lord God Almighty, thank you for this meal, for your daily provision, sustenance, and abundant blessings. We pray for wisdom for our leaders, strength for our military service members and families and civilians, and protection and courage for those who fight tonight. This we ask in your name. Amen. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rockets roared glow, the bombs bursting in air Gave roof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Good, please be seated. Thanks to our major, thanks to the, 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 to the band for a wonderful performance. The next time you'll hear that song is about eight o'clock tonight, game four, National League Championship Series. General Vano knows the outcome of that game. We'll see. So again, welcome to the Dwight David Eisenhower luncheon. We're, we're glad that you're here and glad that you've taken the opportunity to, to join us here. Just a, 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 you met all the Army senior leadership coming in. Just a couple of other folks to, to recognize, beginning as we always do with America's great heroes, Master Sergeant Leroy Petrie, Staff Sergeant David Bellavia, Medal of Honor recipients, Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us once again. Hey, I, I think they like you. I think they respect you even more. Yeah, thank you very much for that. A couple others to, to single out. The Honorable Rudy DeLeon, former Deputy Secretary of Defense. Secretary DeLeon, where are you, Rudy? Thank you very much. The Honorable Bob Spear, the Honorable Patrick Murphy, former Acting Secretaries of the United States Army. Gentlemen, glad that you have joined us. I think we have the 31st, 32nd, 33rd, 34th Chiefs of Staff for the United States Army. 
uh, General Vano, General Sullivan, General Reimer, General Shinseki. Again, gentlemen, thank you very much for your inspired leadership over many decades. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Sergeants Major of the Army, Ken Preston, Ray Chandler, Dan Daly. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We're glad that you're here. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the 2018 George C. Marshall Medal recipient, Ms. Martha Raddatz. Okay, I'll get out of your way now. Please enjoy your lunch. We'll be back in a few minutes and we'll begin the awards presentation. And then, as I know everybody is looking forward to, to hearing from the 40th Chief of Staff. Please enjoy your lunch. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon once again. I hope you had a, a very enjoyable meal. How about a round of applause for this great staff serving us here this afternoon? Before we, we hear from our distinguished speaker this, this morning, just uh, or this afternoon, uh, a couple of other uh, in introductions. You know, one of the things that we're going to do here in just a moment is, is recognize a, a number of soldiers and non-commissioned officers of, of excellence, but there are many more of them than will come up on the stage. So if I could, for the soldiers and non-commissioned officers of excellence, the non-commissioned soldiers and non-commissioned officers of the, of the year at their home stations, the drill sergeants, recruiters of the year, career counselors of the year, if you're, if you're one of those uh, soldiers of excellence who has won a competition at your home station, Please stand and let us thank you for your excellence and for your commitment. <laughs> Secretary McCarthy and I were talking at lunch, and we we're glad that we served when we did because we didn't want to compete with you because we couldn't compete with you, right? So that's a very, very good thing. There's a number of our uh, 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 officers and not senior non-commissioned officers from uh, allies, friends, and partners from around the world, without whom the United States Army cannot accomplish all that it needs to. If I could ask our international partners, please, to, to stand. Let us thank you for your attendance and presence today. You know, the, the chief's a big guy, he's got broad shoulders, and he carries a heavy load for the United States Army day in, day out. Uh, he can't do it without the backbone of the United States Army. Uh, if we could ask all of the sergeants major to please stand, and thanks for all that you do in guiding all the officers and the soldiers. Yeah, some of you know I started my career as a soldier as the driver for our battalion command sergeant major, and I kind of been intimidated by sergeant's major for the rest of my life, and that's probably not a probably not a bad thing. You know that uh, this uh, Dwight Eisenhower luncheon has traditionally been used by the chief and by the sergeant major of the army uh, to recognize this uh, the the outstanding soldiers and non-commissioned officers. And so if I could, General McConville, invite you and Sergeant Major of the Army Grinston, if I could ask you to the, to the stage in front of the podium for the presentation of this year's awards. Would the recipient of the Stephen Ailes Ralph Haynes Jr. Award please come to the stage?
the Stephen Ailes Ralph Haynes Jr. Award is presented annually by the Department of the Army to the Outstanding Drill Sergeant. This year, Outstanding Drill Sergeants, representing all the United States Army Training Centers, competed in a Headquarters U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command competition for this coveted award. The 2019 Army Drill Sergeant of the Year is Staff Sergeant Ernest J. Knight II. Would the recipients of the General Maxwell Thurman Recruiting Excellence Award please come to the stage? The General Maxwell Thurman Recruiting Excellence Award is given each year to the Army Recruiters of the Year. During General Thurman's tenure as commander of the U.S. Army Recruiting Command, he significantly improved the quality of Army enlistees and helped create the professional Army of today and he played a key role in fostering the public's positive perceptions of America's Army and its great soldiers. His influence left a mark on Army recruiting and set high standards for today's Army recruiters. The non-commissioned officers selected as the top Army recruiters for 2019. From the regular Army, Staff Sergeant Jonathan E. Hagen. From the United States Army Reserve, Sergeant First Class Jordan S. Ferrari. <laughs> and not present today, from the Army National Guard, Sergeant First Class Todd Crawford, who is attending a professional development school. Would the recipients of the Army Retention Excellence Awards please come to the stage? The Excellence and Retention Award is given each year to the Career Counselors of the Year. Retaining the very best soldiers is critical to the Army's mission of growing and developing leaders for the future. Career counselors support Army commanders by identifying and counseling soldiers and non-commissioned officers of their value to the force and potential to serve in positions of increased responsibility in today's and tomorrow's complex world. The non-commissioned officers selected as the top Army career counselors for 2019. The Army career counselor of the year is Sergeant First Class Rolando Wilder. The Army Active to Reserve Career Counselor of the Year is Sergeant First Class Eric Ramos. <laughs> Would the recipients of the Expert Soldier Badge please come to the stage? The concept of the Expert Soldier Badge began in 2015 as part of the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command's NCO 2020 strategy. The Expert Soldier Badge is awarded to soldiers who are neither infantry nor combat medics who demonstrate excellence in the performance of their warrior tasks and battle drills. Testing also includes a 12-mile foot march, land navigation, and the Army physical fitness test. The badge was approved on June 14, 2019, and enters service this month. The following soldiers are among the first to earn the expert soldier badge. Sergeant First Class Christopher L. Harvey, Joint Base Lewis McCord. Staff Sergeant Julio I. Macias, Fort Campbell. <laughs> 
Staff Sergeant Freeman L. Harris, Stuttgart, Germany. Staff Sergeant Tyler B. Lewis, Fort Bliss. Sergeant Michael A. Ostrander, Joint Base Lewis McCord. Staff Sergeant Bradley A. Sherman, Fort Benning. Staff Sergeant Anthony N. Lodiong, Fort Bliss. Staff Sergeant Mike M. Mata, Fort Sill. <clears throat> Staff Sergeant Evan R. Nielsen, Fort Jackson. Staff Sergeant Joseph A. Alarcon, Joint Base Lewis McCord. Staff Sergeant Thomas R. Jacobson, New Orleans Recruiting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, the first recipients of the Expert Soldier Badge, please join me in a round of applause for all of our outstanding non-commissioned officers. Well, thanks, Chief. Thanks, Sergeant Major of the Army, Grinston. Thanks for that uh, opportunity for us to, to join you in recognizing those soldiers and non-commissioned officers of, of excellence. It is. Uh, it is truly a, a big deal. You know, the Dwight D. Eisenhower luncheon has been used for 
for several years as an opportunity for the Chief of Staff of the United States Army to lay out his vision, his view of the Army. As Mrs. McConville told me a bit early, the State, state of the Army address uh, for, the, for the Chief. And so we are very, very honored this afternoon to have for his first uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower luncheon. Please join me in welcoming our Chief, the 40th Chief of the United States Army, General James McConville. In a complex world, our greatest strength is our people. Always has been, always will be. Regular Army, National Guard, and Army Reserve. Executing every mission, preparing for everything. And that's why people matter. Every soldier, every Army civilian, every Army family, every soldier for life. Every one of us. People who make up the best equipped, best trained, best led force in the world. People who serve something greater than themselves. Ready now, investing in the future across every domain. Because in today's complex world, when the stakes are high, America calls its army. And when that call comes, second place is not an option. We'll remain ready. We'll modernize. We'll compete. We'll fight. And we will win. Because winning matters. Winning matters. Yes, it does. Well, good afternoon and welcome to all the special thanks to General Carter Ham and your team for putting together another fabulous AUSA event. Today is a great day to be in the United States Army, and I'm truly honored to serve as the 40th Chief of Staff. I'm extremely excited about the Army leadership team that we have in place, led by a great secretary, Ryan McCarthy, and supported by a super team of the Honorable Jim McPherson, Sergeant Major of the Army Tony Grinston, Vice Chief of Staff of the Army Joe Martin, and Director of the Army Staff Walt Pyatt. I could not ask for better teammates. I know we have several former chiefs, acting secretaries, and vices here, as well as a, quite a few other general officers and Sergeant Majors. Thanks for being here. And every generation has its heroes, and we have two of them with us today. Medal of, Medal of Honor recipients, Master Sergeant Leroy Petrie from Afghanistan and Sar Staff Sergeant David Bellavia from Iraq. I know you already stood up, but I, I, I feel obligated to recognize. Can you do it one more time for me? These are great American heroes. Thank you. You inspire us. I also want to rec recognize our remarkable wounded warriors that are here today. And our Gold Star families, we have some, and thank you. Your loved ones gave all, and we'll never forget their sacrifice or yours. I know we also have some of the congressional staff members in the room. We really appreciate you being here and all the work you're doing to get us the resources we need to be ready now and in the future. And if you need to leave early to finish that bill, you will not hurt my feelings. <laughs> and I'm pleased to have so many of our allies and partners here. Thank you for coming. We never want to fight alone, and we are stronger, working together shoulder to shoulder, promoting security and stability around the world. And I said earlier, it's an incredible honor to be, a, to be here as the Chief of Staff of the Army. And I'm wearing the new Army Green Service uniform today. So what do you think? You know, I, I think they're a fitting tribute to our greatest generation and a way for us to tie the current force to the heroes of World War II. Those great soldiers, when our country was attacked, they raised their right hand and they said, send me. They fought across Europe 
and the Pacific, and they won. They established the world order that many people enjoy today and that we are committed to preserving. I was fortunate enough to meet one of the heroes of that greatest generation in Normandy, Jim Pee Wee Martin. And Jim joined the famous 506 Infantry Regiment, the Band of Brothers, in July of 1942. He was soon given the name of Pee Wee because he was the lightest man in the regiment. He accepted that nickname as a badge of respect. And he was just 23 years old when he jumped into Normandy with the 101st Airborne Division on D-Day in 1944. Jim and his band of brothers went on to fight across Europe and to defeat Nazi Germany. 70 years later, on the anniversary of D-Day, he jumped back into Normandy again at 93 years of age. In that day, Jim Pee Wee Martin, he told me three things. He told me they still liked to jump, which made sense because he was a paratrooper. He said it was much less scary this time because no one was shooting at him. <laughs> and he told me he was willing to serve if we still needed him. Well, I told Jim that although recruiting is tough, and we saw some great recruiters here, I think at 93 he has done more than his fair share. But the story doesn't end there. Just the other day, I found out that Jim had jumped back into Holland again at 98 years of age for the 75th commemoration of Operation Mockingbird. How about that? I share Jim's story with you today as an example of the great legacy or heroism and grit of the American soldier. One secured and endured by the sweat and blood of American soldiers for 244 years. It's a legacy that Jim and his fellow soldiers forged in World War II. It's a legacy that's carried on by our soldiers in Korea and Vietnam, in Just Cause, in Desert Storm, and more recently in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. And now it's a legacy that we've been entrusted to carry forward by adding new chapters of heroism and ultimately passing this legacy on to future generations. But just as those have gone before us, we know it won't be easy because we live in a time where committed violent extremists threaten the lives of innocent people all around the world. We live in a time where nations in Asia and Middle East threaten regional stability. And we live in a time of great power competition where near-peer competitors threaten to disrupt the world order we strive to protect. So the United States Army, it stands ready today to compete, to deter, and if necessary, to fight and win now and in the future. Because in our profession, winning matters. And we win through our people. They are the Army's greatest strength and our most important weapon system. And that's why people will always be my top priority. And when I say people, I mean our soldiers, regular Army, National Guard, and Army Reserves. I mean our families, I mean our civilians, and I mean our soldiers for life, our retirees and veterans. We will take care of all of our people and provide a positive command climate where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. To do that, we are publishing the very first Army People Strategy. It'll address how we take care of people by recognizing and managing their unique skills. People don't want to be treated like interchangeable parts in an industrial age process. They want to be recognized for their unique talents. They want purpose, they want belonging, and they want a pathway to success. And when our people are treated this way, we know they will perform better, they'll stay longer, and they will make our army stronger. So as we move forward, we will manage our people and their talents more effectively. We also have the obligation to provide our people with the quality of life benefits commensurate with the quality of their service. So we're identified and committed to five quality of life priorities. Quality housing, both for families and our soldiers in the barracks. World-class health care, quality child care and youth services, 
meaningful employment for our spouses, and fixing the PCS moving challenges we have right now. We have initiatives in each of these areas, and we'll go into more detail on those in the Family Forum this afternoon. We also have to build cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit, and can win on any battlefield. They form the foundation of our army and counter behaviors that break trust in our formations, like sexual assault, sexual harassment, and suicide. So along with managing talent and providing quality life benefits, we will empower soldiers and leaders to build cohesive teams to accomplish not only our people goals, but to deliver on our Army priorities of readiness, modernization, and reform, which as Secretary McCarthy laid out yesterday, are not changing. We're aggressively pursuing readiness, modernization, reform to make sure we can always fight and win. We've done a great job of restoring tactical readiness over the last several years. Now we need division and brigade commanders to stay focused on it. We will resource it, but I need you to build and maintain it. You own it. Tactical readiness, that's your fight. We also have to build strategic readiness to make sure we can mobilize, deploy, and sustain our forces on the battlefield. That's our fight at HQDA in the major commands. We're going to exercise our strategic readiness in ways we haven't exercised in decades. Next year, as part of Defender 2020 in Europe, we'll mobilize and deploy forces in the largest exercise of its kind in 25 years. We'll follow that with a similar one in the Pacific. The intent is to work the entire strategic readiness enterprise, ports, railheads, airfields, ammunition and preposition stocks, all of it, to ensure our strategic capabilities align with the requirements we anticipate for dynamic force employment in the future. At the same time, we also have to capitalize on the hard-won momentum we've established over the last two years with modernization and reform. We cannot be an industrial age army in the information age. So we will transform our linear processes to be more effective, protect our resources, and to make better decisions. We're at an inflection point now, much like the army coming out of Vietnam in the early 70s. Then we face great power competition with the Soviet Union. To compete, we've changed, we changed the way we trained and fought with the development of air land battle. We modernized our war fighting systems with the development of the Big Five, and we transformed our people processes by instituting the all-volunteer force. Transformational initiatives that many of the gentlemen sitting at the front table were involved in that sustained American land power supremacy for the last 40 years. Now we find ourselves once again facing threats of great power competition in the specter of large-scale conflict. And we have the opportunity to ensure that our Army remains the most dominant land force in the world for the next four decades. But we have to adapt. This is not about fighting the last fight better, but it's about winning the next fight. So when we talk about modernization, it must include building multi-domain doctrine, organizations and training, delivering the six modernization priorities, and implementing a 21st century talent management system. We already have an initial multi-domain operations concept that we rolled out last year at AUSA, but we have to go further. Now we're refining our understanding of multi-domain operations through war games and exercises. We're experimenting with organizations and capabilities of the multi-domain task force in support of both Indopaycom and UCOM. And together we'll use what we learn to produce updated doctrine for how we fight. As, that we, as we move forward, we are evaluating organizations at every echelon to ensure they're optimized to win on the future battlefield. As an example, we are reorganizing Army Cyber Command to synchronize Army information warfare capabilities. Its new alignment will change how we conduct information warfare by integrating employing and employing intelligence, information operations, cyber, electronic warfare, and space capabilities to provide combatant commanders with the options to compete below the level of armed conflict. 
We are aggressively prototyping and developing systems for long-range precision fires, the next generation combat vehicle, future vertical lift, the Army network, air and missile defense, and soldier lethality. And in the next two years, we will field the new mobile short-range air defense system and the integrated visual augmentation system. We'll field the next generation squad weapon in 2022 and the precision strike missile, the extended range cannon, and the first hypersonic weapon battery in FY23. In 2025, we'll field the next generation tactical unmanned aerial surveillance system. And in 2026, we'll begin fielding the optionally manned fighting vehicle to replace the Bradley. And shortly after that, we'll begin fielding our future vertical lift aircraft, all part of delivering our six modernization priorities. But no matter how much techno technology we develop, soldiers will always remain the centerpiece of our Army. We equip people, we don't man equipment, and that philosophy will not change. And to ensure we recruit and retain the right people for the Army, we are also implementing a 21st century talent management system, a system that allows us to see the tremendous and diverse talents in our force and employ them in a way that improves the overall readiness and lethality of the Army. Our current industrial age personnel system manages people basically by two variables. You're a captain of infantry or you're a sergeant of engineers, and that's really it. So to compete for the talent of the extraordinary men and women in the civilian sector and to recruit and retain the best and brightest, we have to do better. Therefore, we're moving towards a talent management system where we will manage people by 25 variables instead of two, a system that recognizes and capitalizes on our people's knowledge, their skills, their behaviors, and even their preferences. And I know it's almost blasphemous to think the Army would actually consider someone's preferences, but if we know where they want to go and what they want to do, we believe we can get the right person in the right job at the right time, and we will have a better Army and more committed soldiers and families. The implementation of the integrated personnel and pay system, if say, is really a critical part of that. It's ongoing now, and it will bring all three components onto one personnel and pay system. This will prevent us from losing our National Guard and Army Reserves soldier records, as many of you all know, and messing up their pay when they come on active duty. And we're going to fix that. We have to fix that. And we need to take better care of, of our people in, in the Army Reserves. And if say will do that, and it'll set the foundation for the information age talent management system we need. We're also putting in place a comprehensive assessment program that will measure our people's knowledge, their skills, and attributes at key points in their careers to help us manage their talents. I'm talking about a program where we measure cognitive and non-cognitive abilities through a variety of measures to get a better picture of the skills in our force. Whether it's identifying them for command, or graduate school, or a range of other programs, we're going to go beyond block checks on evaluation reports. And we'll start with the Battalion Commander Assessment Program this year. The officers being considered will be screened by a command board. And then the top qualifiers will compete in person in a five-day assessment program at Fort Knox in January. Right now, we spend more time and money selecting a private to be in the Ranger Regiment than we do on selecting what I would argue is one of the most consequential leadership positions in the Army, our battalion commanders. And we're not stopping there. We're considering expanding assessments to our sergeants major and brigade level commands in the future based on what we learn in January. We're also looking at a full life cycle of assessments that generally aligns with professional military education gates and we'll see where we go from there. Our efforts so far have been focused on leaders, specifically officers, but I want to be very clear that the 21st century talent management and taking care of people extends to all of our people. So after we prototype and test these programs with our officers and make sure we have them right, we'll expand them to our enlisted soldiers, to our civilians, and to our reserve components. We'll manage the talents of all of our people not just a select few. Well, that's how I see the Army and the way 
moving forward. Everyone has a part to play, and together we can and will be the Army America needs in the future. And it's the future, our Army's future, that I want to end with. This is Lieutenant Marshall Plumley. He's one of our newest Army officers and a recent Ranger School graduate. And I met him at the Maneuver Conference at Fort Benning last month. Lieutenant Plumley is a graduate of Duke University. He's a Division I athlete, and he's a former professional basketball player, among other things. But really, he is just a wonderful young man. And he chose to serve because he saw purpose, belonging in a pathway uh, to success in the United States Army, along with some great mentoring from General Bob Brown. And every day, hundreds of other men and women like him, each with their own unique and interesting stories, make the same choice, the choice to serve something bigger than themselves. Our future is bright, and our Army is in strong, and through our people, it'll be that way tomorrow, the next day, and every day after that. And so I say to those nations who wish us harm, and to those countries who threaten our security today or, to no or tomorrow, I'm not going to tell you that our soldiers are 10 feet tall, but I will tell you some are pretty damn close. <laughs> America needs the Army to invest in the future, and we are. And as a result, America will never be outgunned, it'll never be outranged, it'll never be overmatched again. Understanding our sacred obligation to defend the nation, we will always be ready to fight and win because winning matters. And we send the United States Army somewhere, we don't go to participate, we don't go to try hard, we go to fight and win. There's no second place or honorable mention in combat, and we win through our people. God bless you all in this great country of ours. People first, winning matters, Army strong. Hey, thanks, Chief. Hey, I got my new attire here. Um, Gary Sinise and the Lieutenant Dan Band. All right, coming tonight to this ballroom. So if you're in, in oh, it's free. All right, free, F-R-E-E. -E. So if you're not here tonight, you're in the wrong place, perhaps unless you're at game four of the National League Championship Series. Uh, but uh, sorry, Rick Morris, sorry about that. Uh, but this will be the right place to be. Again, Chief, thank you very, very much. You know, Chief talked about talent management, and Chief, I would tell you, your talent management program has already got the first step right. They got the right officer and the right assignment at the right time to be the 40th Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Well done. Okay, let's just still do this afternoon. The chief walked, through it, walked us through the modernization priorities and get down on the exhibit floor and you can see the progress that is being made across the United States Army and across the great industries that support the Army in achieving those modernization priorities. We encourage you to take advantage of that. Take the opportunity to meet these non-commissioned officers and soldiers of excellence. Take time to participate in the Professional Develop Forum that occur throughout the afternoon today and throughout the day tomorrow. We look forward to seeing you here tonight for Gary Sinise and Lieutenant Dan Band. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow night for the George C. Marshall dinner. Chief, again, thank you very, very much for your leadership, for your wisdom, for your inspiration to keep this Army strong. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our luncheon. Please remain in your seats until the head table has cleared the room. <laughs>